Welcome to 3ABN Spring Camp Meeting 2017, Exposing the Counterfeit. Amen and amen. Your grace is so very, very amazing. I'm going to ask you to turn with me to the very first book of the Bible, the very first chapter, the very first verse. Genesis chapter 1. Verse 1. Shall we pray? Father God, be pleased now to teach us, teach us your word, show us your will, help us to understand what truth is, and to walk in the way of truth. In Jesus' name, amen. The Bible says, Genesis 1 1. I like to read it. I like to be seen reading it. The Bible says in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. I um, read a couple of books to prepare for this message. The first one I bought in 2011, read it several years ago. It's called Science Discovers God. Seven convincing lines of evidence for his existence. So I use just a little bit of this. Then I've re I'm reading now, I don't have enough faith to be an atheist. <laughs> it's, it's a real good book. And I like this book because it confirms a lot of the things I've been preaching almost all of my ministerial life. So I read a lot from this. So what we're going to talk about tonight is an amalgamation of this book, this book, the book, and some of my own homespun. I should like to introduce you to and refer you to Dr. Michael Denton. You may know the name. He is an MD, a PhD, and a biologist. I hasten to add that Michael Denton is not a believer. He is a self-proclaimed atheist which he interprets as meaning he does not know God and he as a PhD MD biologist does not know if God can be known. Michael Denton says he is not sure, excuse me, that God exists. He doesn't know, but what he does know as a PhD doctor biologist is that natural selection, evolution over creation has some issues. His thinking is that he is an evolutionist who doesn't buy evolution. He doesn't accept it, yet he claims himself to be an evolution. What, what a conundrum. What an apocalyptic conundrum to be so smart, to be so brilliant, and yet be so confused. I mean, he knows that evolution is fake news. <laughs> Yet, he is not sure about God. What a position to find yourself in. But Michael Denton attests in his writings that before Charles Darwin died, he didn't believe in evolution either. By the time the third edition of Origin of the Species was published, Charles Darwin, the father of evolution, didn't believe in his own theory. He disavowed the baby that he gave birth to. So before we address and or redress evolution and try to prove if it is provable, I want to talk to you about truth. Can I do that? I want to talk about truth. 
And I want to use a football analogy. Let's erect now some immovable goal posts. You know what goal posts are? Those are those things at the end of the football field, those uprights, they never move. My thesis is that there are some realities in life, ladies and gentlemen, brothers and sisters, that either are or they are not. Amen. Amen. You will forgive my pejorative English. They either is or they ain't. <laughs> there are some realities in life, they either are or they are not. No vacillation, no hesitation, no equivocation, no rapprochement, no detente, no propitiation. They either straight up is or they ain't. Either God did it or he didn't do it. Amen? Amen. Either he did it or he didn't. Game, set, match, close, quotes, end of story, hallelujah, amen. amen. Someone said to me recently, CA, and they were very serious, everybody can't be wrong. And I thought about that. And the truth is, I believe that's true. Everybody can't be wrong. But I told him in response, I also believe everybody can't be right. Mm -hmm. Everybody can't be right. You've got 4,200 different religious classifications. Of those religious classifications, you've got tens of thousands of religious belief systems. You've got 2.1 billion Christians. You've got 30,000 Christian denominations. In the Muslim faith, you've got Sunnis, Shias, and Sufis, and 9,000 subclassifications. You mean to tell me everybody's right? It is true that everybody can't be wrong. But there, you will forgive my pejorative English, ain't no way everybody is right. Amen? Amen? They cannot all be correct. And that too is true. Now I want you to stick with me because I'm going somewhere and when I get there, I want you to be right by my side. All right? Here's something else that is true. Spiritually, the majority has never been right. Amen. Amen. God's not looking for a majority. So if you look at the history of the world, the majority spiritually has never been right. They weren't right in Noah's day. And I suspect they aren't right today. The Bible is unapologetically apologetic on this point. Genesis 1, 1. Barashith. Elohim bara. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. True or false? True. Say it again. True. Say it to my face. True. Say it with my back turned. <laughs> John chapter 1, verse 3. All things were made through him, and without him nothing was made that was made. True or false? True. 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 Amen. Colossians chapter 1, verse 16. For by him all things were created and that are in heaven and that are on the earth, visible and invisible. True or false? True. Say it again. True. One more time. True. Amen. It's like that movie that came out several years ago, A Few Good Men. Some people can't handle the truth. <laughs> truth has nothing to do with you. Ontologically. Now, what do you mean? I mean, truth is discovered, not invented. Mm -hmm. God made man. Man didn't make God. True or false? True. God knew who you were before you knew who he was. True, True or false? True. Mm -hmm. In fact, 
God knew who you were before you knew who you were. True or false? True. Mm -hmm. And the truth about God is that everything that is true about God existed long before we came into existence. God said, let us make man in our image. We are made in the image of God. God is not made in the image of man. So when you came to the age of reason, you didn't invent God, you discovered him. Amen? Amen. Yeah, you didn't invent God. God was already there. You discovered him. Sometimes you hear people say, I found the Lord. <laughs> well, that's just jargon. You didn't find the Lord because the Lord wasn't lost. You were. <laughs> so you stepped into a consciousness that has always existed. You discovered God. You found him. You were lost, not God. Now hold on to a while because I want to give you some truth about truth. Here's the truth about truth. All that is true about God has always been true. Amen. Amen. Everything that is true about God tonight has always been true about God. There's nothing new about God. God came complete in the beginning. Since he has no beginning, he's always been complete. Amen. So everything that's true about God tonight has always been true about God. That's the truth. Seven quick facets of truth. One, all truth excludes the opposite. If it's true, can't have the opposite. C.A. has a lot of hair. <laughs> that ain't true. So truth excludes the opposite. If this is true, that cannot be true. Amen? You cannot have parallel truths. It's either true or it's not true. C.A. had a lot of hair. That's true. Number two, truth is discovered, not invented. I said that before. You discover truth, you don't invent truth. Truth is separate from you. Three, Truth is transcultural. What's true in America is true in China, is true in Japan, is true in Africa. All real truth is transcultural. God made the heavens and the earth. He made you and me. He made those who believe in him. He also made those who don't believe in him. Amen? Amen. So truth transcends culture. Number four, truth is unchanging. Now what we think about truth may change. There was a time when folk believed the world was flat. Was it flat? No, the truth was it was round. So our belief system had to change. But the truth was the truth then, is the truth now. Amen? Amen. So truth is unchanging. Five, a fact is not changed by your belief. Just because you believe something doesn't make it fat. And a fact isn't changed because you believe it. Guy called me the other day, told me how much he used to hate God because his wife died and his then pastor told him that his wife was burning in hell. He said, I stopped going to church. I was done with God because I thought God was a mean God. Now, was that the truth? No, but that's what he believed. Then he happened to watch proclaim and he heard a sermon that I preached on the state of the dead. And he realized that his wife was not burning in hell. And he said it was like the clouds just rolled away. Amen. He said, for the first time, I could look at God as a loving God. So when you got to the Sabbath, he said, that was no problem because I knew God loved me. So I was ready to give up Sunday and keep Sabbath. Upshot, he said, now I'm a baptized Seventh-day Adventist church. Amen. So now he's in love with a loving God. But when he hated God, God was still a loving God. So your belief cannot, does not change truth. Truth, number six, is not affected by the attitude of the one professing it. 
Truth is still truth, whether you got a good attitude or a bad attitude. But it does have an effect on how it is received. In other words, a loving Christian person is a better witness to a loving God than a mean person. Amen. Amen. Now, God is still loving in the mouth of that loving person and in the mouth of that mean person. The truth is that the mean person is just a bad witness. But it doesn't change the truth about God. But it can change how the truth is received. And number seven, all truth is absolute truth. I don't half truth or three quarters truth. All truth is absolute truth. You can have contrary beliefs, but you can't have contrary facts. Amen. Amen. Facts are facts. Now, if you're thinking, if you're a thinking one of those proactive persons who examines sermons and tends to break them down and you kind of think ahead, you've already hatched two lines of reasoning that you probably think can refute what I've just told you. And I'm ready for that. In fact, the first one, I'm not going to even bother telling you because I don't want to, I don't want to jauntus your pure minds. But the second one I want to spend a little time on because I've heard it and you may have heard it and I want you to be prepared the next time you hear it. I want to give you some ammunition to fight back with. Let's talk about self-defeating statements. What did I say? Self-defeating statements. Amen. We're going to de deal with self-defeating defeating statements. A, these are, well, let me give you an example. A self-defeating statement is, there's no such thing as truth. Anybody ever heard that before? Folks try to lay it on it. Oh, there's no such thing as truth. It is a self-defeating statement because it fails to meet its own standard. A self-defeating statement is a statement that fails to meet its own standard. If a person says there's no such thing is truth as truth, rather than try to prove that there is such a thing as truth, what you need to do is ask them, do you believe that that statement is true? Mm-hmm. Yeah, that statement is self-defeating because it defeats, it fails to meet its own standard. If you believe that there's no such thing as truth, you're believing a lie. And you cannot believe that because your statement by your own words cannot be true. <laughs> that makes sense? So if you say there's no such thing as truth, you are saying something that you yourself don't believe in. So I don't have to prove to you that there is truth because you've uttered a self-defeating self statement that shoots itself in the foot. It cannot be true. Now here are some other self-defeating statements. All truth is relative. You heard that before. Relative to what? Relative to truth? The statement makes no sense. It's self-defeating. There are no absolutes. Are you absolutely sure? <laughs> That's true for you, but it's not true for me. Now try telling that to the policeman the next time you're caught doing 80 in a 50. <laughs> That's true for you, but it's not true for me. Yeah, try that and see what happens to you. <laughs> when you wrestle with evolution, it becomes easier if you believe in absolute truth. I believe in absolute truth. I believe there is absolute, unmovable, unshakable truth to be found in this world. If you don't believe in an all-wise, all-knowing, all-powerful God, that is to say, an omnipresent, omniscient, omnipotent creator, then let me say this kindly, you have got a problem. 
Amen. Amen. You see, I have no problem with evolution because it's not a fact. Hello. Hello. <laughs> now, some scientists try to say that it is so, but this scientist, PhD, Ariel Roth, says most scientists have to admit it's not a fact. That's why, in lay terms, it's hard to prove something like that. Now, what does it mean to prove? We'll do this quickly. One, to prove something means to establish the truth or genuineness by evidence or argument. Two, to establish authenticity and or validity. Three, to subject to a test, experiment, comparison, analysis, or the like, to determine the quality or amount or acceptability, characteristics, etc. The problem with evolution is all of those scientific prerequisites go out the window because evolution doesn't meet any scientific prerequisites. So scientifically, to prove something as fact, it has to be subject to empirical observation. In other words, you got to see it and examine it for yourself. In short, you've got to test it. That means you've got to subject it to experimentation, comparison, analysis, and those tests must be repeatable. You can't say it happened once, it'll never happen again. You've got to do it again and again to make sure it is fact. Now here's the theological and philosophical challenge that evolution at the start poses. It wasn't observed. Amen. <laughs> Nobody took a selfie. <laughs> There's no video. You cannot compare it to anything because even the evolutionists say it only happened once. It has not been repeated. It is not being repeated. It only happened once and nobody recorded it. It cannot be analyzed. It cannot be authenticated. It has never been repeated. But creation, brothers and sisters, praise God, is different. That event was witnessed and documented by, by not one, not two, but three individuals. Amen. Amen. Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. And they left a record. Amen. You see why it says, I don't have enough faith to be an atheist? It takes much more faith not to believe in God than it does to believe in Him. Amen? Amen. So the scientists say, we got a theory, and the Christians say, keep your theory, we got God. Amen. We believe God created the world in six literal days, six literal morning, evening days. If you believe that, say amen. amen. Now, he created in six days by fiat, not the little car, but by the word of his mouth, F-I-A-T. That means by decree. Amen? Amen. Psalms chapter 33, verse 9, King James. For he spoke, and it was done. He commanded, and it stood fast. That's fiat. He spoke the word, world into existence by the word of his mouth. So our faith, ladies and gentlemen, is based on and anchored in two realities. Who created us and how we are created. And they both go together. If he, God, created any other way than by fiat, he could not be Almighty God. So that not only rules out evolution, but all the hybrid themes also, like deism or theistic evolution. Theistic evolution, also called orthogenesis or nomogenesis or emergent evolution 
or creative evolution. They came from the mind of a Jesuit paleontologist, Pierre Tillard de Chardin, who proposed that God directed evolution. It was evolution, but God just directed it. Came up with that in the late 1800s. And then George Frederick Wright spoke about Christian Darwinism. These were attempts to harmonize and synchronize Bible belief with what they thought was science. And then we go back to the Anglican priest and botanist John Ray. Um, these men, I assume, were honest, but they were certainly misguided in their attempts to harmonize God and science. But also, they tried to make God subject or the servant of science. Now here's the truth. God uses science. Amen. Amen. God created science. But God is above science. Amen. God is not subject to science. Science is subject to God. And when God chooses, glory to God, he can throw science out the window. Amen. Amen. Do you know what it's called when God throws science out the window? I heard somebody say it. It's called a miracle. <laughs> Amen. Amen. Sometimes God just says, I don't want to be held hostage to science. I want to do this. And though it doesn't make sense to the scientists, it makes sense to me. So he throws science out the window. And you go to the doctor and he says, yesterday that was cancer, today it's gone. Amen. It's called a miracle. God didn't need millennia to make you and me. He commanded it. You see, if God can't create by fiat, then ladies and gentlemen, he can't, he can't, he can't save by fiat. If God can't call you into existence, he can't save you by the word of his mouth. So that means justification, which is a declaration that you are righteous, is out the window. That means the thief on the cross, Christ can't say to him, I say unto you right now, today, you're going to be with me in, par in paradise. That was done by the word of Jesus. Justification is by fiat. Christ declares you righteous. So if he can't create you by the word, he cannot recreate you by the word. You getting this? Amen. So that means when the thief said, when the thief said, uh, um, remember me, Christ would have to say, okay, you need to hang out on this cross for a couple million years while I, while I do my evolution thing. <laughs> and I'll get back to you. So if God can't create by fiat, he cannot recreate by fiat, he cannot save by fiat. So we serve then a powerless God. So long, so how long does it take to recreate you? So the next time someone goes to a doctor with some mysterious syndrome, and the specialist says, we don't know what that is, let alone how to treat it, and we don't know how to cure it. You think God has to say, well, science has no cure. Nothing I can do. Since when is the creator subject to science? Now let's look at the eschaton and work our way back. Time's getting away from me. Let's look at the eschatological point and then work our way back. 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 52. 1 Corinthians 15, 52. The Bible says we shall all be changed in a moment in the twinkling of an eye. The Amplified Bible says this, we shall be completely changed and wondrously transformed. The perishable becomes the imperishable. Now, how long does it take for God to give you a brand new body? In a moment? 
in the twinkling of an eye. So God is going to do it at the end in a moment. Now, how is he able to do it at the end in a moment? Well, hello, because he did it at the beginning Amen. in a moment. Amen. He's got practice. Amen. He's done it already. And he's done it many times. He created the world and Adam and Eve by fiat. And in a moment, these old bodies are going to be made brand new instantaneously. Yeah. Recreation is no problem for the God of creation. God creates through the power of his word. I believe in the power of the word of God, don't you? Yeah. Psalms chapter 138 verse 2, God honors his word above his name. The Greek tells us the position that God believes and that he puts his word in. So the word of God is live and living and it gives us power. Now let me promenade down the corridors of your imagination for just a moment. The gospel of John we call, well I call, uh, a touchless gospel. We've talked about this before. Here's what you find in the gospel of John. All of the miracles in the gospel of John are by remote control. Mm -hmm. Every one of them. There is no touching in the Gospel of John. Look it up for yourself. They're all remote miracles. It is a touchless Gospel. There's no putting on of hands. There's no laying on of hands. There's no touching in the Gospel. All the miracles are touchless. Check it out. It's true. They are remote miracles. No laying on of hands. All of the miracles are done by the Word. And that's why John starts out by saying, in the beginning was the Word, words with God, Word was God, the same was in the beginning with God. And then he goes on to recount a series of miracles all done by the Word. Now I know you're thinking, okay, well what about John chapter 9 where Christ made uh, saliva into mud and put it on the person's eyes? But the miracle didn't take place then. The miracle took place when, when Christ said, go and wash. And so the miracle took place out of Jesus' sight. Same remote miracle. Amen. Amen. No touching. It's a remote gospel. Now, why did he do that? He did it for this reason. Because by the time John wrote, Christ had been dead and resurrected 60 plus years. John wrote in the late 90s, just before 100 AD. Everybody that walked with Christ, remember John was the youngest of the, of the disciples. Everybody that walked with Christ had already died. And those who they knew had already died. John's audience, the only audience that he had, the only connection that they had with Jesus was through the Word. They didn't see him. They didn't touch him. They didn't know anybody who saw him or touched him. The disciples were all dead. So their connection to Jesus was the same as your connection to Jesus. Amen? Amen. So John didn't just write for them. John wrote for you. Amen. Amen. Amen? So John talks about the Word, and John's message is this. Even though you have not seen him, even though you have not handled him, even though you have not touched him, when you got the Word, you've got all power and you've got all you need. That's the message for us this very night. Though when you got the word, you got all you need of Jesus. And you latch onto that word through faith. So John's message is, when you got the word, you've got what you need. So, theistic evolution, no de deism, uh, which says that God got to start and just let it run. No interference like the Sadducees believed. John is saying that Christ is present and active in your life today, recreating just like he created the heavens and the earth. Amen? Amen. Philippians chapter 3, verse 10. That I may know him. Lastly, if God didn't create mankind, then... 
the heart of our faith is ripped out. We struggled in the early 1860s and on May 1, I think it was 1863, God was pleased to give us the title Seventh-day Adventist. There were a lot of conflicting titles. In fact, James White wanted us to be called the Church of God. And Ellen White said, no, I don't think so. <laughs> she said, that name hides as much as it reveals. We need something a little closer to the truth. And so God gave us Seventh-day Adventists. If God didn't create us in six literal days, then the seventh day is out the window. Amen. That makes sense? Yes. Yeah. What is the Sabbath a memorial of? Mm-hmm. Yeah, it is. So if God didn't create us, then the Sabbath is a lie. And if God didn't create us in seven literal 24-hour periods, then what is the Sabbath? Is the Sabbath millions of years? Does that make sense? Does God have to go through death to create life? Every time you keep the Sabbath, you are reaffirming that God made us in several seven literal days. Can you say amen? amen? Yeah, that's what the Sabbath reaffirms, that I came from the hand of God. Amen. Now, if, if you came from God, then you've got an assurance when you die that you're going back to God. Mm -hmm. But if you don't know where you came from, if you came from I don't know, when you die, where are you going? I don't know. I don't know. <laughs> See, the only chance we have of believing in a future life is the fact that we came from God. If we came from God, then I know I'm going back to God. Amen. To believe otherwise, you got to believe that daddy was a gorilla, mama was a chimpanzee. I don't buy that. <laughs> the Bible says in Exodus, let's see, 1331, nope. It's Exodus 31, 13, that we are sanctified through the keeping of the Sabbath. That every time we keep the Sabbath, it is a sign that we are sanctified by God. It is a reaffirmation that we came from the hand of God. You know, if everybody kept the Sabbath, there would be no atheists in this world. You can't keep the Sabbath and worship on the Sabbath day and then go out and say, and go out and say that we came from a, something crawled out of the ocean and became a fish and became a man and became a this and became a that, became a that, and then one day walked up and stood up on his feet. Makes no sense. Now in New York, some of the scientists say that super roach <laughs> is, is part of the evolutionary process. Super roach is, is this roach that they have in New York City that is DDT resistant. Now, that's, that's, that's not evolution. That's adaptation. You spray enough DDT around, after a while, the roach gets tired of that. I'll tell you the truth. One day, I was visiting an apartment, and a super roach was crawling up the wall. And, and the, 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 the lady in the apartment threw her shoe and hit the roach. And the roach said, So super roach is not evolution, it's adaptation. Amen. There is no evolution. And every time we keep the Sabbath, we reaffirm that we, are, we came from the hand of God. In three places, Matthew chapter 12, Mark chapter 2, and in Luke, I think it's chapter 18. Six. Is it chapter 6? Six? Six. It's 6. Okay. 6-5. Six, five. Six, Mark 2, 27, 28. Matthew 12, 8. All of them say the same thing. Jesus Christ is Lord of the Sabbath. Lord of the Sabbath. They all say the same thing. 
He's Lord of the Sabbath, and he's Lord of our lives. And every time we surrender to the Lord of the Sabbath, we are saying that we came from the hand of the Lord. Amen? Amen. So these words are full of instruction and comfort. Because the Sabbath was made for man, not man for the Sabbath. It belongs to Christ. We belong to Christ. For all things were made by him, and without him was not anything made that was made. Since he made all things, since he made the Sabbath, since he set it apart as a memorial of the work and week of creation, then we are, by keeping the Sabbath, making a statement to the world that we came from the hand of a loving God. It points us back to God as creator and sanctifier. And every Friday evening when you bring in the Sabbath, you are reaffirming not only that God made you, but that that same hand is now active in recreating you. And that you are anew and again a child of the Most High God. You are reaffirming the power of God, twice created by God, and ready to be created a third time on our way to the kingdom. That will be the final creation. Now let's answer the question that is part of this sermon. I need to say this. All of this that we've been talking about is just preamble. This is, this is not the sermon. The, the sermon is coming right now. <laughs> Here is the sermon. Can the theory of evolution be proven, which some scientists call fact. Here then is my apologetic. Unvarnished, perhaps unscientific, and maybe even lacking in sophistication. Certainly devoid of hubris or hyperbole. If it could have been proven, it would have been proven. And perhaps should have been proven. But it hasn't been proven because it can't be proven. So really, the sermon is very short. <laughs> because the answer to the question as asked is no. <laughs> Amen. Amen. Say it one more time. Amen. Mm -hmm. <laughs> one last text. Well, two last texts. Romans chapter 1, verse 20. Romans chapter 1, verse 20. Have you ever asked yourself, why is there such an some, some animosity from the non-religious community to those of us who believe that we came from the hand of God? Why is there such hate? I was listening to a British scientist, an eminent, eminent, he got a long list of letters behind his names, and he said, you know, creation is so boring. So boring to think that, that, that God made us and we just spoke us into this. That's so boring. And my question is, Irma and I are sitting on the couch, what's boring about knowing the truth? What's boring about knowing things as they are? How is that boring? How is it more exciting to know that you came from an ape <laughs> than it is to know that you came from the hand of God? What's boring about that? Romans chapter 1, I'm reading verse 20, and I'm almost done. Romans 1, 20. For since the creation of the world, for since the what? Creation. The what? For since the creation of the world, his invisible attributes are clearly seen, being understood by the things that are made. So the Bible is saying we can tell a lot about the invisible God by looking at the stuff he made. Amen? Amen. 
when you look at the beauty of the flowers, when you look at the, the diversity of, of, you know, I like the fact you got white, you got black, you got brown, you got red. Amen. And all kind of colors in between. <laughs> you know, my, our, our family, I married into Irma's family. She had two children. I am black, they are white. Um, but our, 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 our grandsons are blonde-haired, blue-eyed. And I love to go out with those, with those little grand boys and just blow everybody's mind. <laughs> what, you don't see the resemblance? So you can tell a lot about who God is and what God is by looking at what he's made and the way he treats what is made. So uh, the Bible says his invisible attributes are clearly seen being understood by the things that are made, even his eternal power and Godhead, so that they are without excuse. Amen? Amen. So you don't have any excuse for rejecting God. Because if you open your eyes, the heavens declare the glory of God and the earth shows forth his handiwork. Yeah. Just look around. Yeah. It didn't come by accident. Why is it that we got two eyes in the front and two ears on the side and one mouth, by the way? Think about it. <laughs> Came from the hand of God. That was design. And design presupposes a designer. Amen? Amen. Yeah, you got designed because somebody designed us. Amen. Now we don't look as good as we one day will look. But we're doing all right. <laughs> The Bible says, because that when they knew God, they glorified him not as God, neither were thankful, but became vain in their imagination, and their foolish heart was darkened. Professing themselves to be wise, they became fools, and the fool has said in his heart, there is no God. See, it's not just a scientific thing. It's a spiritual battle. It's a battle between darkness and light, error and truth. It is Satan's design and desire to erase God from the minds and memories and hearts of those that Christ came to save. I end with the very same text with which I began. Genesis chapter 1, verse 1. And if you don't believe this, then you might as well close the book because everything else is based on the fact that in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Amen.